Uh, thank you all for joining us today for this introduction to preprints. Uh, we'll be discussing what preprints are all about, how the Center for Open Science and our partners are collaborating to facilitate community-led scholarly communications. My name is Matt Spitzer and I'm the community manager at the Center for Open Science and we're excited for today's topic because we've been seeing a lot of um, attention for preprints lately from funders, from publishers, and a lot of others within the scholarly communications world. Everyone on the call today is on defaulted to listen only mode, but please use the Q&A feature in the meeting interface to submit your questions as we go along. We'll uh, all monitor that actively throughout the webinar. We'll spend about 35 minutes covering um, several topics and then spend um, at least 10 minutes answering questions that, that come up uh, during and at the end of the, the conversation. Starting us off today will be uh, Philip Cohen. He's a sociologist from the University of Maryland College Park. And Philip is also the founding, a founding member of Social Archive, the Open Archive of Social Sciences. Philip's going to speak about preprints, postprints, what they are, what the benefits of preprints are for researchers, and he'll address some common concerns that researchers have, such as how one can check publisher guidelines on posting preprints. I'll then follow uh, Philip and talk a little bit briefly about the role that the Center for Open Science um, is playing in facilitating community-led um, communications and the technology that we're using um, to build OSF preprints. And then my colleague, Courtney Soderberg, will show you how to use OSF preprints for both search and for submitting um, a preprint to the services. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Philip Cohn from Social Archive to get us started. And Philip, if you want to go ahead and grab the uh, screen share, you'll get this. Uh, thank you, Matt. Also, thanks, uh, Courtney and Jolene at Center for Open Science for organizing this. I'm really happy to have the chance to be here and talk about uh, preprints and uh, the OSF preprints and Social Archive in particular. I'm going to uh, start with uh, going to start with advancing my slides. Uh, a brief uh, definition on uh, discussion on terms, working papers, preprints, postprints. Um, some overlapping terms and some ambiguity there. Uh, I'll give some of the rationale for why people want to share uh, preprints, why I think you should want to share uh, your papers, um, and then uh, uh, something about the strategy of when is appropriate, uh, when is most advantageous, and uh, finally, um, I'll go over a couple of common concerns, and by then, um, I'll, I'll be brief on those and, and let people express their actual concerns, but I kind of foreshadow uh, some of the things that um, that have come up a lot in this discussion so far. Okay, uh, uh, you could uh, you could call them all papers if you want, um, but uh, in different disciplines, in different corners of academia, there are uh, uh, different definitions that people use, and sometimes it can be confusing. Um, we shouldn't be too hung hung up on these. The important things the important thing is you're sharing your research um, uh, and uh, getting the benefits of doing that. But it is useful to know what people are talking about. Uh, first term working papers. Um, these are uh, usually understood to be a, a, a completed draft of something that's ready to read, but something that has not yet been peer reviewed. Uh, and the implication with the term working is that there are additional revisions to come. So uh, you can read and share a working paper, you can learn from it, um, you can uh, benefit from the collaboration, uh, you can uh, get feedback, um, but it's generally understood that the paper is not um, in its final state. Uh, when people use the term working paper. Preprints, on the other hand, uh, there's actually a lot of definitions um, and they overlap with uh, working papers to some degree. So in some disciplines, um, preprints would include the entirety of what I just described as working papers. Um, in some there, uh, some people use the term more narrowly to refer to a finished draft, which is specifically ready to be peer reviewed. So it is about to enter the journal publishing stream. Um, uh, and then uh, on the, as you move along, there are additional uses of preprint that refer to a paper which has been accepted but is not yet in print. And you will see, um, for example, some journals have a list of papers um, that they publish, they post online that are not yet in print, quote, in the magazine. Um, important uh, concept here is that for some disciplines and specifically in the biosciences, I believe, um, uh, they, they specifically mean not peer-reviewed when they say preprint, and that can be an important distinction uh, as far as the norms uh, of, the, of the discipline. And finally, postprints. Um, postprints, uh, you can think of as the open access version of a published paper. So the paper has been uh, peer-reviewed, it's been accepted, and it's either in the pipeline or it's already come out in the journal. Um, it's understood to be peer-reviewed, and 
depending on the uh, author agreement and the, the terms uh, that the journal sets, this may or may not include the journal copy editing and formatting and so on, but it is understood to be um, the final version, more or less, uh, final version, the accepted version at least, uh, of a paper. And, and this is uh, often just a way of, uh, of uh, distributing a free copy, an open access copy of a paper which is going to be or is already behind a paywall and therefore has limited access. So I'll move to talking about the rationale here a little. Um, uh, uh, generally, I'm going to make the case, and, and this is the, the point of the preprints uh, effort, uh, is that it's more efficient, it's more engaging, it's more inclusive. Uh, so it, it makes our work better. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, how that works specifically. Uh, an important angle is time. Um, there's, a, there's a very unfortunate rhythm that many of us have adapted to in academia, which is, um, that uh, uh, you work and work and work on something, and when you're finally ready, it's done, and you're you're happy and proud and ready uh, 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 to have it start having its impact. You send it off and wait for months when nothing happens. Um, and and uh, how many times have I been at a conference or been talking to somebody and they say, "Boy, I really have a terrific paper. You're going to love it when it comes out, or it's under review now." And um, and it's and you're you know it's terrific. Well, um, the the point of preprints um, uh, is to uh, just skip that step. Uh, not skip as in you don't do it, but to skip the waiting part to get right to the part of sharing it with the people who actually want to read it. While um, often, uh, if you want, going through the process of peer review also. Um, uh, a key aspect uh, of the rationale for preprints is simply access. Um, uh, we want our work to be uh, uh, evaluated, to be uh, uh, judged by our peers in the peer review process, but we also want it to reach people. Uh, uh, it's disheartening uh, when uh, we work on something, especially something with public funding, but all of us who have jobs in academia are funded by the public one way or the other, um, and to have our work come out and be uh, uh, locked up, to be um, not accessible to people who, who might want to read it. And often we don't notice the paywall when we're on a campus that subscribes to everything, but uh, more and more people are chafing at the, at the paywall, and the preprints is, a, is an important way to, uh, to help get beyond that uh, and, and open up access to our work. And then uh, the engagement uh, inclusivity aspect uh, is very important because it's, it's a key part of uh, both increasing sort of accountability and effectiveness in our work, but also really um, improving our scholarly engagement, our engagement with other researchers, with uh, interested parties in the public, uh, and, and with uh, the, the people we don't know yet who may be interested in our work. And uh, the, the goal of uh, preprints is partly to um, uh, uh, be more efficient, be quicker, open access, and then also to um, specifically facilitate the connections that we can build um, by getting work out earlier, faster, and, and more open. Uh, and, and reclaiming the, pub, the, pub, the process of publishing, by that I mean um, we don't have to subject ourselves to um, uh, strictly to the legacy system of publishing, which has built in delays and inefficiencies and costs. We can still use that system if we want to, but we don't need to. Um, and we can do our work uh, more efficiently and more engagingly and more inclusively if we uh, share our work earlier. Okay, so when to share uh, a paper. Uh, I think you can sort of, this is, as you can see from this, I think you should share papers all the time. Um, but specifically to think about it for a particular project, when you've reached a point where you've got something worked out, but you're ready to have some feedback or engagement, when you're ready to identify potential collaborators uh, and get their feedback, a uh, key point for a lot of people is when you have to have a draft ready to submit to a conference. Um, you're, you're ready to have strangers look at it in that setting, so you may as well uh, have a, a broader array of people looking at it. The same applies to when you're submitting it to a journal. Uh, we can talk a little bit about um, the fears that people have when doing that uh, later. When a paper is accepted, it's especially rewarding. You can, you can say to people, you can put on your social media or in public various places, look, I've had a paper accepted, it's been judged uh, um, good by the peer review process, and here's a free open access copy of it. That's a very powerful use of, of preprints. And then after the paper is published, the, uh, the open access version, the postprint, which can really just be the preprint updated after the paper is accepted, um, is a way to make it available and accessible to people beyond the paywall, as I mentioned earlier. 
So I'll talk about a few common concerns uh, uh, that, that worry people when they think about um, uh, taking the step of sharing their work openly outside uh, the journal system, uh, and we'll see if we can um, uh, can address some of those. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some people um, uh, really are, are are concerned that they are uh, that their work is not good enough yet. Basically, and people might not say this exactly in those terms, but I think that's sort of what comes out. Um, and, and we use the peer review system to uh, to give us to give us that reassurance. But I think it's okay to be proud of the work you've done. To say, look, I have. I, I, there may be mistakes. We're going to go through the peer review process, but this is good enough to talk about. It's good enough to show, uh, and we're going to learn from our mistakes and catch them as early as possible um, and try to improve it together. Uh, there is a there is a broad concern that by publishing preprints and working papers, uh, we will might, we might make them ineligible for publication in our favorite journals or the most important journals in our discipline later. Uh, it is uh, generally the case, however, that this does not happen. Um, there are some journals that, that have uh, restrictive rules where they won't allow publication of papers that have already been shared, um, but, um, uh, but this is not the case with most journals. And if it is the case with one of your favorite journals, um, I would recommend having a different favorite journal because they don't have um, your best interest or the best interest of science in mind if they, if they have that policy, my opinion. Uh, the American Sociological Association, for example, in my discipline, has an explicit policy that they will consider and publish papers that have been shared um, uh, publicly as long as they have not already been peer reviewed. So that's the distinction. Um, the other major concern uh, that a lot of people have is that their ideas will be stolen if they share the papers openly. I think this is completely backwards, but very understandable because people are really afraid and they're also, uh, uh, most of us were raised in a system where journal publication is how you own an idea. But we post papers um, uh, publicly on social archive, social archive or OSF preprints or one of the other sites um, with a timestamp. It's public. It has our name on it. We can share it widely. Um, and this is really our best protection. Um, the people stealing your work is a violation of norms. Um, and we can uh, we police that by uh, by uh, challenging it when it occurs. The best way to do that is to um, have proof that it's your idea. Um, uh, if people literally take your work and put their name on it, that's fraud. Um, and and they could, that can happen with a journal publication paper just as well as with a preprint. So that's sort of a separate issue. Um, uh, finally, uh, uh, well, finally, two more points. Um, oh, one is that um, there's, a, there's a sense, especially because of the proliferation of low quality open access journals, um, that open access itself is um, suspect, that it is something that desperate people do to show off their work when they can't get it published um, sort of legitimately uh, in, in the journal system. And I think uh, my only, uh, my only uh, response to that is, uh, is to uh, suggest, to ask, um, to encourage us to change that culture, um, to uh, get the word out that openness is better, better for science, better for the communities we serve, and better for our careers. Um, and to not be so worried that uh, if I do something, uh, if, if my work is in the vicinity of some work that's not good, it will taint my work. Our work rises and falls based on the responses of the people who, who read it, who understand it, who need it for their work. Um, and we can, uh, we can reap the benefits of openness without um, worrying about the, uh, um, the status of the, the genre, so to speak. Uh, and of course, over time, we hope that this will change. Um, uh, on the, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the issue of licensing, but um, there is also a concern that someone will make money off your work if you share it publicly. Um, uh, no offense, this is actually quite unlikely. Um, however, if it does happen, really that's good. Um, if you're planning to submit it to a, a for-profit or an association journal published by a for-profit publisher, um, you're already making money for somebody else and not yourself. Um, we get our money mostly from our jobs, from our, our grants and so on, and um, uh, we want our work to be as shared widely as possible. And remember, if you post a paper uh, with a non-restrictive license and somebody takes it and uses it and puts it in a book or something and finds a way to sell it. Um, uh, that's, that's not hurting you because it's not money you would have made in the other way. And the paper is still available for free. Um, so uh, there's a limit on how much they can do with that. It's not like they get to take it down off the site after um, they use it. But anyway, this is quite unlikely. Uh, we do recommend using a non-restrictive license, uh, like a CC0 license, um, uh, and then policing uh, the use of, of our work uh, through professional norms rather than through, um, uh, through uh, law. Uh, uh, and again, you know, if somebody steals it and puts their name on it, that's fraud and we have protections for that. Uh, and, and finally, there is the concern, uh, and 
sad as it sounds, there are a lot of academics who write papers and then they're afraid that they don't have the right to share them themselves. Um, the author agreements we sign are dense and difficult um, and uh, the, uh, 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 they're intimidating. Uh, so I, I'm actually not going to demonstrate this. I'm sorry, I don't have time. But uh, if you uh, Google Sherpa Romeo, you find a very nice uh, searchable database, which will show you the policies that apply to uh, almost any academic journal. Um, your author agreement is ultimately what govern is it governs uh, what you can post. Um, but the Sherpa Romeo database is a good guide for the standard policies in journals. And you're going to find that um, almost every journal allows posting of some version or another, um, especially before you have um, before it's been accepted and published for sure. Um, but most things uh, uh, can be shared in one form or another. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up there. We'll take your questions. Um, I just want to uh, uh, take 10 seconds to plug a conference we're having at the University of Maryland in October. Uh, open Scholarship at the Social Sciences, the deadline is coming up, so go to socialopen.org to, um, to submit a paper. And finally, to contact me, uh, there's my information below. Visit Social Archive on the OSF uh, preprint uh, site, and, uh, and I'll look forward to the discussion. And thanks again uh, to COS for organizing this. Well, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes talking about um, the role that the Center for Open Science is playing here with preprints. Um, as uh, hopefully some of you know, the Center for Open Science is a nonprofit technology organization that's dedicated to improving the alignment of scientific values and scientific practices. So really along those lines that Philip was talking about, which is, you know, really changing the norms um, and, and following, um, changing the culture around some of these, these practices. And you can learn more about um, all, many of the other programs and initiatives that we have at um, cos.io. Um, specifically, the Center for Open Science is contributing to the adoption of preprints with the extension of the Open Science Framework, um, which is a free open source infrastructure um, that we are the developers of. OSF Preprints is an open preprint repository built as a modular framework to provide additional um, integrated and turnkey branded services for any scholarly community like Social Archive, um, which, which uh, Philip is a part of. So the OSF at its core, you know, behind the OSF Preprints, is a research collaboration platform for supporting the documentation, the archiving, and sharing of data, materials, and the diversity of outputs that arise in the entire research lifecycle. And we connect to a lot of other services that you probably use in your day-to-day -day activities um, to, to conduct your research. And so as such, preprints can really be seen as a natural extension of that research lifecycle output and can easily be used independently um, of the OSF or in combination with an OSF project as, as Courtney will show you here um, after, after my uh, few slides. But there are some really, there's some key features um, about our approach with OSF preprints that I think will provide some benefits to the wider scholarly um, community without creating additional silos of information. So I just wanted to cover those real quickly so that you have a, a, a sense of, of the way we're thinking about the infrastructure that we're building and how it relates to, to other services that are out there. First off, the OSF preprints um, is using an aggregated um, um, service. So behind the OSF preprints is a, is a tool called Share, um, and it aggregates information um, across preprint services. Currently, 13 are integrated so far. Um, this includes both those that are built on the Open Science Framework, as well as those that are um, out there and hosted by other groups, such as Archive, BioArchive, PeerJ, and Repec. And this currently represents access to over 2 million preprints, all searchable at one site at OSF preprints. Second, it's brandable. Um, any group that wants to offer a preprint service can launch and manage a fully functional service for their community. And when I say manage, I don't mean the technical side, that's the part that we take on, but manage the community, the education, and, and the promotion of the service within your scholarly um, community. So while we offer OSF preprints as a general preprint service that accepts submissions from any domain of scholarship, the real power comes from the, um, the, this public infrastructure that is supporting branded services run by the communities themselves, such again with Social Archive and, and uh, Phillips Group. So far, we have six branded services in production. 
So Social Archive for the Social Sciences, Sci Archive for Psychology, Engineer Archive for Engineering. And in addition, we've had our partners launch AgriChive for Agricultural Sciences, um, BITS, which is a group out of Berkeley for the uh, for Social Science Research Methodology, and most recently, Law Archive for Legal Scholarship. Um, across these new services, more than 2,000 preprints have already been posted in the last several months, and growth is accelerating. In the coming weeks, we'll be adding six new preprint services. Um, these are the ones that so far are scheduled to be released, and we have more in the works um, to cover paleontology, marine research, contemplative sciences, uh, research and focused ultrasound, and the library information services. In addition, uh, it's also very important to know that OSF preprints is a free and open source tool. OSF preprints um, is public goods infrastructure, and all of our code is available at the Center for Open Science GitHub repo. So what's next? Um, the next major release for OSF preprints will be a moderation review layer. Uh, preprint communities will certainly be defining their own moderation and review standards. Some services may offer very lightweight moderation services like BioArchive and Archive do today. But others may, may want to offer more rigorous review. Some may offer both pre and post moderation, and some may stay completely open. Um, some may experiment with different forms of transparency in the moderation process, but the most important thing is the goal is flexibility to facilitate control and self-direction by each community that best fits their norms and practices uh, for their discipline. And as a result, this will encourage direct engagement by researchers and experimentation of the scholarly communication pipeline by communities of researchers. This is already fostering collaboration and sharing between communities. Um, I know, for instance, Phil and, and others um, working on some of these other groups like SciArchive and Engineer Archive are collaborating on a lot of uh, really interesting ideas and best practices. So what it all means, um, the Center for Open Science's approach and mission to increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility of scholarly research by building public goods um, like preprints infrastructure, it provides substantial benefits for the scholarly community. Um, probably number one is deduplication. Um, so as a modular and open source project, there's no need for redundant development of infrastructures. New capabilities are developed for one use case, and it instantly benefits the entire community of users. Each one of these groups doesn't have to go out and build uh, infrastructure from, from scratch in order to uh, serve their community. That also provides an economy of scale. So everything we do is reusable and shared, and it's less expensive to run and maintain, uh, potentially by orders of magnitude. So everything we do is parallelized across each one of our, our branded services and, and new groups that come forward can, can, can reap that benefit. Um, the deployment of expertise is a really critical um, uh, factor here. So developers focus on the deployment of our secure and robust scalable enterprise infrastructure, which leaves the scholarly communication experts to focus on the process, the education, the promotion of preprints. You don't have to become a, a technology or infrastructure expert in order to um, you know, help foster preprints within your community. And last, uh, innovation. So the open infrastructure, it lowers the barrier significantly um, for entry and gives groups the freedom to experiment with scholarly communication practices while leveraging a robust infrastructure that supports both new and traditional models. So we really appreciate any feedback that you have on this endeavor, and we certainly welcome collaboration uh, with any scholarly communication experts out there to support the variety of use cases for preprints, uh, moderation, and other publication practices. And of course, if you would like to launch a preprint service for your community, just be in touch. My email address is here on the screen, um, and we'd love to talk to you, and I, I can certainly go into way more detail on, on the process and, and the steps to go from just having the idea for a preprint service to actually launching one, and it's, it's actually a lot easier than you think. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Courtney um, to do a walkthrough of, of actually using uh, hands-on, using OSF preprints uh, for search and submission. All right. Uh Thanks, Matt. So I'm going to go ahead and show you all um, kind of how you go about posting a preprint as well as searching preprints using OSF preprints. So just let me share my screen really quickly. All right. Um, so everybody should be seeing my OSF preprints uh, slide. So actually, the first thing I want to do is go ahead and check Sherpa Romeo. Um, that site that Phil was talking about to make sure that I can post um, a preprint or postprint. So um, if you Google Sherpa slash Romeo, it should be the first one that comes up. Um, but it's sherpa.ac.uk slash Romeo. Um, and so I can just look up the title of the journal, either that I'm thinking about publishing my paper in, or if it's a postprint that I've already published my paper in. Um, so I'm going to look up psychological bulletin. 
did a search. And then what you can see is it gives me kind of indications of yes, Psych Bulletin um, allows preprints. It allows postprints, but it does not allow me to post the publisher's finalized version. So I can't post the copy edited version um, of the paper, but I can post that last manuscript version that I sent to them. And then it gives me some very particular information, uh, information about kind of uh, specific things that I need to do. So I have to, for example, link in the publisher's version of the DOI. Um, but this is all pretty standard. Um, it looks like I am able to post the preprint of an article that I had published in Site Bulletin a couple years back. So I'm going to go back to OSF preprints. So as Matt mentioned, OSF preprints is kind of the general preprint server. I can put preprints from any discipline I want in here. Um, because this is particularly a psychology article, I'm actually going to scroll down and use SciArchive, um, which is the psychology domain specific preprint server. So I'm going to go ahead and click add a preprint. And then I have two options. If that manuscript copy already existed on an OSF project, I could click connect preprint to existing OSF project. Um, and that would allow me to search through all the projects that I already have on the OSF. However, um, this uh, file doesn't exist on the OSF already. It doesn't have a project related to it. So I'm going to say upload new preprint. Um, so I am going to drag my PDF in. Um, and then it's going to ask me some general information about that preprint. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy the title and stick that in there. All right. And then it asked me to provide some general information um, about what sort of discipline this preprint relates to. So it's social and behavioral sciences. Um, and different preprint servers will have different um, options for this kind of keyword taxonomy. Um, so I'll say psychology. And then I can say, uh, let's say it's quantitative and it's social. Um, you can see that I can pick multiple um, taxonomies. So if something, for example, was mostly psychology, but I also wanted it to be uh, kind of indexed for life sciences, I could also say there's a life science option. It has a neuroscience bent to it, um, and it's about cognitive neuroscience. Um, I'm going to take that one out because this is not actually related in any way to uh, neurobiology, but I'll pick whatever uh, taxonomies I want and then click save and continue. So now I have some choices about the license. Uh, I'm going to put a CC0 license on there, um, but I could also pick CC BY, which is Creative Commons um, attribution, which just means that people need to attribute when they use it. Um, I'm going to apply that license to the OSF project. That will make sense in a moment. Um, and then it says, um, what's the DOI associated with the journal article? This is optional, but I know based on Sherpa Romeo that I have to input this information. So I'm going to go back to that PubMed entry, uh, highlight the DOI, and copy that over. I can also add additional keywords if I want to um, about things that weren't covered in the um, taxonomy. So I could say this is a meta-analysis, for example, about um, control level theory, psychological distance, and this will just uh, be keywords that allows people to find it more easily when they search. Um, and then I'm going to add the abstract of my preprint. Once again, I'm just going to copy and paste this. And then I'm going to save that. If at any point I need to go back and make changes, um, I can go into these different sections, you'll see click to edit, and I can make changes to that, either as I'm going through the process or even once the preprint is done. Um, so because it's my OSF account, um, I'm automatically inputted as an author, um, but I want to add the other people who are authors. So I'm going to search them by name. What it's going to do is it's going to look and see if they already have an OSF account. 
If they do, I can just add them in to the author list. Um, Alison Ledgerwood. If they don't have an OSF account, so um, I don't think she has one. Right, so it says no results found for um, the third author. I could add them and then I would put in their name and their email address. What that would do is create an OSF account uh, for them so that they could be properly added to the list. And I'm not actually gonna do that right now. Um, and I'm just going to click next. So it's just kind of telling me um, what's gonna happen once I submit, which is basically it will create a publicly accessible uh, preprint on Psych Archive. I'm gonna click share. And then this is what the preprint view looks like. Um, as I mentioned, I can go back and edit the preprint. So if I want to, um, if I want to, you know, go back and add Annie um, and Amit, who are the other two uh, co-authors on this paper, I can go back and do that by just clicking that edit button. And you'll see the preprints here. Um, I have a download count, so as people go and download the preprint, um, that'll click up. And then I have that tagging information, the disciplines, the license, um, and the citation for it. This is especially useful um, if it is a true preprint rather than something that's published in, the published in a journal so that people can cite me. I was also mentioning how these preprints are related to OSF projects. So when I upload a new preprint, if I go to visit this project right here, it's created an OSF project behind um, the preprint. So what this means is that if I wanted to upload, say, the data that was associated with this preprint, um, I could upload it directly to the project by clicking on that OSF storage, clicking upload, and then getting a search through my computer. Um, and those would then show up on the preprints page. It also allows me to version the preprint. So if I were to upload um, a file with the exact same name into this project that had some changes made to it, um, it will update the preprint to a new version. So you'll notice down here, if I go back to that preprint page, it says version one. Um, so this is a post print, so the version is not likely to change. Um, but if the article had to be corrected for some reason, it might. Um, if this was a working paper or a preprint, um, you know, maybe I get it back from the journal and the editors want me to make some changes. I could then just upload a new version rather than having to create a whole separate um, preprint page for that edited version. So now that the preprint is up there, um, I can actually go over search really quickly. So if I go to search, this will give me a search through SciArchive, um, and I can do that. So I could search, say, for any um, preprints related to stereotypes. Um, and you'll see that I can, uh, I can specify that search a little bit more by those subject tags um, that I was adding when I was creating my preprint. However, maybe I think that other disciplines outside of just psychology might be interested in stereotypes. So one of the things I can do using OSF preprints is take advantage of the fact that it allows me to search across a wide variety. So if I put in stereotypes here, what it's going to do is it's going to search across all of those preprint providers both the ones that we've set up as branded preprint servers, but also the preprint servers that we just index. Um, so for example, CogPrints or um, preprints.org or PeerJ. So I can search in one place, look across all those providers, and then get information about those. So let's say I actually decide that I just want to index um, preprints that are related to stereotypes from PeerJ and maybe also CogPrints. Um, I can filter the search and there actually aren't any um, results from those. Probably because PeerJ is mostly um, for biology, so it'd be a little bit weird if stereotype information was uh, in there, though it could happen. So let's say I looked for something a little bit more bio-related. Um, I know that biologists will often post in bioarchive, but I also know that they 
um, post in PeerJ. So rather than having to search across both of those independently, I can search them once here and get information from both of those providers. And then I could filter um, by just one of them. So this is only results coming from BioArchive or um, actively filter across both of those. And you can see it tells me on the bottom um, where that preprint is stored. All right, um, so that was mainly what I wanted to go over in terms of showing you all how to use uh, OSF preprints for search, as well as uploading preprints. I showed you how to upload it to SciArchive. The process is basically the same no matter um, where you add your preprint to. So if I click add preprint um, on OSF preprints generally, um, you'll see that this looks right. The process is very similar. The only thing that's really going to differ is in the discipline section where I was saying, you know, it was social science. Um, that taxonomy will look different depending on the different preprint server because each one of them can choose their own taxonomy. All right. Um, so we've had quite a few questions um, that have come in as I've been talking, so I'll start answering those. Yeah, Courtney, I'll, I'll uh, feed a couple over to you. I know one question that came in um, was about license, um, and the question was, do you have to have a license before publishing the preprint? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how you uh, apply a license. Sure. Um, so if I go back to that preprint that I posted, hold on. Um, just search for my name. That'll bring it up easy more quickly. Um, All right, um, hold on, I'll just, for purposes. I'll just search one that I already. Well, more importantly, uh, does um, an author who's posting their own preprint, they, can, they choose their license. They, that's up to their, that's their discretion on what they can apply as a license to their own work. Yeah, so you can, as I showed, you can add the license as you go through uploading the preprint, um, but you don't have to do that. That is not a required field. Um, it's kind of always good practice to add a license um, just because then it makes it really clear how other people are allowed to reuse your work. Um, one thing you'll sometimes see in Sherpa Romeo under these general conditions, sometimes it may specify what license you have to put the preprint under, um, but others don't specify any sort of license. So if um, the journal you're posting a preprint or a postprint for, um, has information about what license you have to apply to it, then you would want to make sure that you definitely apply that license. Um, but it is kind of best practice to apply um, some sort of license when you post the preprint. Great. Can I add one point on that? Yes, please do, Phil. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, one, one reason why uh, it's good to use a non-restrictive license like CC0 is that there are people crawling around the internet uh, doing things that we really want them to do, like meta-analysis, aggregating, uh, research and so on. And if they're doing any kind of automated collection of the work uh, for analysis or something like that, um, they are sometimes put off by a restrictive license and they'll just skip that. So having um, having a, a no license or a CC0 uh, is most encouraging of allowing people to um, to sort of harvest and, and use that work in ways that are becoming increasingly important. Great. And Philip, while you're talking, I know uh, you, you provided some text um, responses in the Q&A panel, but just so everyone else who's maybe not looking there, can you talk a little bit about um, the choice that someone might have for posting to one service versus another? Like if it's, if it's interdisciplinary between psychology and so sociology, why, um, how else one might choose to go between SciArchive and SociArchive? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, sort of we've made the decision to have a lot of different services and let people set their own uh, norms for the communities, but we're, uh, uh, the, we've lowered the stakes of that decision by having everything aggregated under OSF preprints. Everything also now is going to show up in a Google Scholar search. Um, so um, so it's, not a, it's not a very big decision unless there's some specific reason. For example, um, Social Archive is developing a program where people can run their paper awards on Social Archive. There may be a time when there's some programmatic reason to have it on one or another. But generally, I think you think about it sort of like where you would submit something to a journal. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of work is interdisciplinary, but when you publish it, you sort of have to decide where it goes. But I think it's relatively low stakes. Uh, uh, and at the moment, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you can't, um, you can't post the same work to more than one of the services. 
Um, so, uh, so just so just pick one and and um, and try not to worry about it too much. That is correct. Although it is something that we are it is on a roadmap to um, to allow that in the future is to allow a single preprint to be uh, discoverable on multiple services. And there's obviously some metadata issues to work through on that. Um, but, but especially once different groups have different types of moderation service, um, that's something that we certainly envision happening. But it, you're you're right. Currently, that is not available uh, today. But it's something that we're working towards. Um, so let's see here. A couple other questions that came in um, was over about Google Scholar. Um, there was one particular question about how long it takes for something to appear on Google Scholar. Um, you know, this is relatively new on our side of things. So um, my understanding is that take, it's actually relatively quickly. It's really up to Google how often they crawl. Um, so far, it's been happening pretty quickly. Uh, I'd say within less than a day. Um, but we're still monitoring that, and, and hopefully we'll have some um, better data to, to answer that question on. But right now, it's a little bit um, inconclusive. I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, there's another question on features around commenting. Um, currently, there is no commenting on the preprints interface. Um, but as Courtney showed, there is a OSF project behind the scenes. And, and there is a standard um, OSF um, project commenting space, which um, if you have a public project, you will be notified of any comments made there. Um, again, it is on our roadmap, um, and I'd be happy to show that link again in just a second. Um, but we are going to be porting this commenting feature over to the preprints itself uh, in the near future because we do agree that getting that, that feedback and that commentary um, um, directly on the preprint um, uh, service is certainly important. Right now, obviously, you can, you can post the link and, and have those dialogues um, in, in other venues. Let's see here for other questions. I know several folks pointed out the Sherpa Romeo database again, and that is a wonderful resource. Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, one question asked about citation of preprints, and I know that's been a recent um, issue of, 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 of interest um, for several folks. Maybe, Bill, do you have a, a comment about um, citing preprints? Uh, yes, well, there are different uh, uh, norms emerging about this. Um, in, in sociology, we don't have this issue so much. Um, we pretty much, our norms are that you cite whatever you, whatever sources of information you have used. Uh, in other cases, for example, grant applications and some journals have uh, rules that uh, you can only cite to certain kinds of work um, uh, in, your, in your references. Um, so that's going to that's gonna vary by discipline. I know the trend has been towards a formally acknowledging uh, the, uh, that preprints are acceptable. It's a little bit dicey because if you have a number of citations in your work, and some are to work that's that's peer reviewed, and some is, are to work that's not, uh, some people really want to see that distinction. So that's gonna that's gonna be the question that you have to decide in terms of how you're going to cite it. If somebody has um, a posted a working paper version of something that's not been peer reviewed. Um, you, you might you might want to cite that differently from something that has already gone through peer review, or you might not. If you're an expert in that subject and you've read the paper and you decide it's citable, um, that's up to you. So uh, I'm afraid it really depends on uh, on the disciplines. But in sociology, it certainly is appropriate and uh, and acceptable to cite uh, preprints. Yeah, that, uh, I'll echo that from the debate that I've seen um, in a couple of different places. Um, that it is going to be somewhat discipline specific, and it's a great debate to have. Um, you know, that's that's part of the sort of uh, experimentation of, of a lot of new disciplines paying attention to preprints is, is some of these practices can be, uh, can be decided upon. Um, and related to that same question that the same uh, person asked about DOI, so right now you can enter the DOI for the final published paper. Uh, we will be adding, um, and actually I think it's in our very next update that's gonna go out, um, we'll be minting DOIs for preprints. Um, so that'll be very, uh, be available very, very soon. Uh, so um, yeah, please look forward to that and we'll be sending out um, some notifications for folks who are using preprints about that so they can assign their DOIs. Um, there's a question about embargo. Um, maybe, Phil, maybe you can answer this one. Um, the question was, if a journal has an embargo, for instance, up to 12 months, does that begin with the EPUB date um, or the formal publication date? How does, that, how does publication date and embargo relate to preprints? Oh, that's a good question. Again, it's going to depend on the license, but that, uh, on, the, on the author agreement, but I know those are hard to hard to read. Um, I, my understanding from just from the ones I've read uh, is that it goes from the publication date of the journal. Um, but uh, I'm probably not, I'm probably not the expert on that. Um, and in some cases, if you have a posted a preprint version, um, you may be able to leave that version up until the embargo. Um, and then after the embargo is over, then you can put up the author, the, the journal uh, PDF version or whatever. Um, so in practice, it might not matter that much, um, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm just not expert on that. 
Okay, yeah, we might uh, need to yeah get some more more opinions on that one. But um, related to that, um, we had a question about CC BY versus CC zero. Um, and again, this is sort of a deep dive in licensing. And I will point people out that um, if you go to the COS uh, YouTube channel, we actually had a webinar on licensing um, specifically a few months ago um, from a representative at the University of uh, Virginia Library. Um, so that might be of interest to anyone with questions about licensing. But just curious, Phil, if you know, um, is CC BY considered a more restrictive license than CC zero? You know, it requires um, credit of the work to the author, um, but it's still open to the public. Is, is right. No, I, I actually was just typing a response to that, which I'll send now. Um, but the uh, uh, I think the it, it is not a restrictive license CC BY. Um, and my own opinion is that it doesn't much matter between CC BY and CC zero um, because crediting authors is normative. It's it's um, required by anybody uh, who's legitimately working in the professions anyway. The idea that somebody would republish an academic paper without identifying the author means they're not a legitimate actor anyway, and they probably wouldn't follow uh, the license if you gave it to them. So somebody who would uh, publish, or would republish academic work without attributing it to the author um, is basically stealing your work anyway. And, and, and um, so anyway, but some people feel more comfortable um, requiring that. And practice, I, I don't think it makes a difference. Um, uh, and I'm not sure what the implications are as far as what I was talking about earlier with machine uh, learning and crawl, crawlers and so on. Um, I, so my my advice is to go with the non-restrictive one uh, and try to win these um, and win any conflicts that arise um, through uh, the court of norms and and culture rather than um, through licensing. That's my own opinion. Great. So there's another question um, around, and maybe um, uh, Courtney, maybe you can show this when you edit this preprint. Um, the question is, can a funding source or some other coordinating center post preprints on behalf of authors? And that is uh, definitely something that you can do because um, we know that is a common practice within some fields. So you can actually submit a preprint and add um, a series of authors and then um, remove yourself from the author list. Maybe uh, Courtney, you can show that real quickly. Uh, yeah, so if I'm in this preprint, I go back and click edit and go down to the author list. Um, so right now, right, it's showing that I can't remove myself. That's because there has to be at least one administrator on an OSF project. And because this preprint is basically a special view of the OSF project, the same thing applies here. So all I have to do is if I change Shannon to administrator, and resave this. Ah, sorry, click too soon. Uh, if I go back to the edit pane, <coughs> should be able. Oh, found a bug. Uh, so I can actually do it. Um, it's a little bug that I can't do it from here. But the way I could do it is if I go back to the OSF project itself, visit the project click on contributors. I have that remove option here because Shannon is an administrator. Click remove. Um, or actually, I could remove myself completely. Um, and then when I go back to the preprint, um, you'll see that I'm no longer showing up. Another thing I could have done was I could have um, go on to the contributors list and just made myself a non-bibliographic contributor. Um, so because I'm not a contributor, it's not showing up anymore. Um, but there was on the contributors tab, um, right between the permission settings and the, re the remove button, a little checkbox that said bibliographic. If I were to uncheck that, I would still have my same permissions on the project. I just would not show up as a contributor. So those are kind of the two options. Yeah, and I, I think the process for removing yourself from the preprint, because the project's already been created, you do have to go through the project to remove yourself uh, from the project. But when you first create the preprint, um, I believe you can remove yourself as a, um, a contributor once you've added another administrator. Um, so yeah, thank you for showing that. Um, there was one other question regarding licensing, and, and it's really just a question around a journal having a very specific license type um, that maybe wasn't available on the preprint upload. Um, so each community uh, or each branded service is, is, is selected from a, um, a selection of licenses um, and some are deciding to be inclusive of multiple or many, many license types and some are saying we'd rather everything here be uh, uh, 
listed under certain licenses. And so it, it's really going to come down to um, uh, maybe communicating with the organizing group behind the, the preprint service. So for instance, if you were submitting to Social Archive and you didn't see a license type that you wanted, um, that it might be worthwhile reaching out to the folks at Social Archive and they do have a, a, you know, an email address and, and a Twitter handle where you can ask those questions. Because um, there are going to be some requirements that maybe publishers put on that, that Social Archive or Sci Archive or other groups um, may have a reason for not offering that particular license type. Um, and this will be something that will be ongoing and, and evolving for sure. So um, just important to ask those questions of, of the groups involved. Um, the Center for Open Science, who's you know building the infrastructure, we're, we're facilitating as much uh, variation and flexibility as we can um, using the, the core underlying core infrastructure that we have. Um, but it's a great question to have as, as I think as authors take more control over the communication of their work, license decisions will become more critical. So it's great that we're all educating ourselves a little bit more about license types and, and what their ramifications are. Um, there was one question um, that came in actually through chat, so I just, just caught sight of it. Um, and we're going to wrap this up in just a couple minutes. Um, um, so I appreciate everyone sticking around for, for the full thing. Um, maybe, Philip, you can answer this. The question is, how well are preprints tied into research impact indicators? And, and maybe more clarification on that question is needed, but I was curious, research, what, what comes, uh, Philip, what comes to mind for you when you hear that question? Uh, well, there is, um, uh, uh, there's research starting to come out on this, but it's, it's all very new and it's difficult to say. For one, we really haven't agreed on what the appropriate way to, um, uh, to, to analyze the impact of, of research, uh, to analyze what the impact of research is altogether. Um, my own sense is that um, the citations to a preprint or working paper are not uh, as important as um, the fact that you're getting the work into the hands of the people who are interested in it, and so that the payoff comes later. Um, so I know that's that's abstract and it's hard it's hard to quantify, but I don't think, uh, for example, if you report the number of downloads for your preprint or um, even citations to the preprint, unless there are a lot, I don't think it's going to make much difference. Um, but I think the difference really comes from um, uh, the improvements we get to quality um, impact uh, and engagement with, by reaching uh, uh, by reaching people who who we actually want to read the work. So not to dismiss the importance of um, of metrics altogether, but um, I think it's going to be it's going to be some time before we can put numbers on this, and I, I don't want that to be a reason why people are uh, skeptical about um, starting to share. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I'll take one more question, and and then we'll we'll let everyone uh, go for the for the rest of their day. Um, the question was is really about relationships with with institutional um, services, institutional repositories, um, and ways that institutions are working to improve um, scholarly communication. Um, and so there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on there. We do have um, some really great relationships with a number of institutions. We actually have a, um, a service called OSF Institutions that allows groups to um, provide single sign-on for their community. It allows them to aggregate public projects. Um, so that project that Courtney created um, could have been affiliated with her research institution, like University of Virginia or NYU or, or UCLA. Um, and we are exploring connections to local um, institutional repositories. We actually are piloting some work to um, services like Fedora and Hydra, which are the backbone um, to a lot of institutional repositories. Um, so yeah, we're very interested in um, um, exploring ways to collaborate um, and make stuff more discoverable. That's, that's a lot of what we're trying to do. And I would encourage your institutional repositories to become members of the SHARE um, so that your, your repository can be harvested by the SHARE service because then if there's a preprint in that service, it's possible that we could add it to the discovery layer um, that is feeding into the preprint search. But at the very least, that share uh, tool set um, will, will harvest that data and make it discoverable for a lot of other different services that are looking at share and using that data. Um, and there's over oh, approaching 30 million research um, events uh, in share. So it's a really robust uh, tool set. And I would encourage any of you to look at that. You can find out more information on that at share.osf.io. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and conclude um, the webinar. Uh, Phil, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Contact really, us. Yeah, definitely. And, and Courtney, thank you for, for showing the hands-on time uh, with, with submitting a, a preprint and search. Um, Courtney and myself are, are available for any questions you have. You can reach out to us um, at cos.io. Um, Phil shared his information um, at Social Archive is the Twitter handle. Uh, for them, and we really appreciate the time everyone um, had the games today. Um, this is certainly an ongoing and evolving discussion uh, within a lot of communities, and uh, we're happy to play a part in facilitating um, as much as we can. So, 
Great. Thank you very much.